Uh, I'd like to call the City Council Special Budget and Finance Meeting for Monday, September 26, 2022 to order. And first of all, um, we'll start with the adoption of the agenda. I'd entertain a motion. So moved. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you, Mr. Furtani. Any nays? The ayes have it. Thank you. Well, welcome, everybody. I just wanted to mention that our colleagues, Councilmember Cassover and Councilmember Bodie, are still um, traveling. They'll be joining us at our next meeting coming up here. Uh, I can't believe it's almost October, but um, we'll have the the band will be back together again uh, at the first meeting in, in October. Um, and tonight we have just one item on our agenda. It's continued discussion of the proposed 2023-2024 biennial budget and city council deliberations and recommendations. As a reminder to everybody who's out there listening or who will listen to this later or watch this recording, when we're in budget season, the city council budget finance committee is considered a, a full council committee of the whole and each member is a uh, voting member as such. So let's get started with uh, a couple of things. Director Vaughn, did you have any thoughts that you wanted to give start off at the beginning or should we just start right into our, our, our uh, questions and deliberations? Uh, I, it's, I do not have any okay. thoughts. <laughs> not, not to put you on the spot. And what I wanted to do too is um, before we got started, talk a little bit about schedule. We do have a lot of meetings scheduled here just in case. And um, if we accomplish our tasks in meaningful uh, and um, less amount of time than we have allocated for them, then we can, um, there's probably one or possibly two meetings that we could um, uh, not have and cancel. So um, I know everybody's interested in making sure we have enough time here and Director Vaughn and, and the administration and I made sure that we had plenty of time scheduled on the calendar so that we didn't have to add additional meetings in case it was necessary. Okay, so what I wanted to do is start out with um, topical things as, they, as we indicated last week um, that we need to be thinking about some themes that we're going to be talking about. And before we really do that, I'd like to see if there are any questions that you would like to have asked, like to ask of staff or talk amongst the group about any specific things that came out of last week's uh, meeting or your examination of the budget. I have a few things myself, but I um, just wanna go around the room. And, and Mr. Furtani, can you hear us okay? I can, thank you very much for asking. Thank you. Yes, please, Councilman Riddle. Thank you. I did have one quick question for uh, Director Vaughn. I happen to notice, and I think I'm just missing a digit somewhere here, but on, um, and the ending fund, a schedule of fund balances and that ending fund balance analysis, the 23-24 revenue for the transportation capital is a little over 5 million. I'm on page 30, hold up, mine doesn't have, 37 and those that have numbers. Um, schedule of fund balances. Schedule balances. of fund balances, yep. Of course. Um, and if you go a few pages back, one, two pages back, I'm seeing it budgeted in the revenues forecast at uh, 4.8. And I was just curious why those two numbers were different and where I'm missing um, some money. You're looking at page 34, the bottom. 34 bottom transportation okay. capital fund. And then, yeah, and then 37 transportation capital. I'm just... So I, I, like I know library light here. Oh, I'm going to bring my own. Um, and if it's not um, readily available, I can take an answer later. I actually have to hit the button. Yeah. I'm probably going to have to go look at the detail and see if something didn't cross over on the Excel spreadsheet. So that's probably not going to be a, a quick answer for this evening, but I will look into it. Thank you. Appreciate the follow up. Yeah, just for Thought, 
I know what it is. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll echo something that um, Council Member Lebo was asking about at our previous meeting and just having a better feel for the various levers that we can control and both in terms of what those levers are and what their consequences are in terms of, well, if we raise sewer rates by this percent, what does it mean? If, but if we go for that percent, you know, it's having some different options and what, what that means for the health of the funds and what sort of projects we'd be able to accomplish. Just having a better understanding of what, what is within our control. Thank you, council member. Um, seems to me years ago, we did a, some couple of what ifs in that regard, um, but I would leave it up to the administration about what um, what is the best way to approach that interaction. Um, Lindsay or Phil, do you have thoughts about the what the what leave, uh, <laughs> levers? I'm 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 going British here because we have two colleagues that I think are I think they're both in Britain right now. Um, just on on point with Mr. Goldman's question. And Council Member Goldman and I discussed this briefly on Friday, but I, I think one of the things that would be good to provide is the the fund without anything done and can you know no increases so you can see how that tracks with ending fund balance at the end of the biennium and we could figure out a trajectory of what that would mean over time and then to give you um, you know maybe a few percentage options of, of revenue, because I think, um, especially with the um, storm drain fund, correct me if I'm wrong, but that 3% is just to keep up with inflation. Um, and I don't think it means, that, no, sewer, I meant to say sewer, not storm drain, sewer has the 3%, just to keep up with inflation. If there are projects outside, I, you know that wasn't intended to cover capital projects, but we were gonna put something together that would give you, you know, before and after action. Excellent, thank, thank you very much. Does that help you? Yes. Okay, perfect, thank you, Administrator Hill. Um, Mr. Lebo, any? Um, along those lines. Could you get your? <laughs> along those lines, I'm trying to understand, and we've talked before about, um, are we generating enough money in our surface water fund, as well as our sewer to uh, manage our costs and as well as our future infrastructure. So I can't tell by looking at this whether or not um, we're in good shape, great shape, or poor shape. And it's hard for me to understand where all the costs are coming from or if they're all attributable to those, to those costs and revenue acknowledged and um i think that that is um what we stated earlier in uh one of the previous meetings when we started this discussion is that um director perigo that is partially why he is would like the both of the surface water and the sewer capital master plans in order to have a good understanding of both the operational and the capital side. So it wasn't clear it, those two, the sewer master plan and the surface water master plan are in the budget. They're not part of the unfunded, which are on the same page. Uh, they're part of the, this is not, um, this is one of the items that we talked about adding as the proviso, but not due to a financial constraint on those, more due to a staffing bandwidth and ability to support um, a consultant in order to complete that task due to some other larger capital projects um, taking place and still being a project manager, having that position essentially be vacant. So one of my uh, parts about that is that, and if we have, a thought that we won't have sufficient staff to do it is to hire staff to do that. I mean, we have a funded position uh, that's currently not supported, recognizing that a consultant costs more, but in order to develop what we think are future uh, 
revenue streams that are appropriate either for grants or for rate increases, we need to have an appropriate master plan. And I would like to see us figure out a way to do that in the upcoming biennium. There are some uh, projects that have been put off um, and planning is something that uh, <laughs> it's like growing a tree. When's the best time to plant a tree? Uh, if not yesterday, today, then. So rather than so I'd rather see this than as a proviso that we think of what the plan is so that we can perform it even if we don't have sufficient staff, which may include hiring staff to manage it. So it's on the record here. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was the question that I was going to ask is, so you're suggesting a proviso that says, if we cannot hire staff within a certain period of time frame, we will go ahead and, and, and bring a consultant to the mix to make sure that these, even though it's more expensive, it'll make sure that those projects do not continue to fall to the wayside. Okay. Does that, um, Phil and, and Lindsay and, and the mayor, is that, does that seem... may... Sorry, maybe. Oh. Wait till you turn yourself. <laughs> um, yeah, what I'm hearing is that it, you know, give ourselves a time limit maximum that we wouldn't proceed with that, and then work into the contract with the consultant that project management time. So th that would be a, an addition to that contract, understanding to alleviate as much as we can from the staff that we have existing. Um, so that's just general oversight. So heard. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I had a couple of couple of questions, and one of which is probably going to be for the chief, and so I can I can certainly reach out to him. Um, well, actually, before I my questions, I, my apologies, Mr. Frotani, did you have questions that you, a question or two that you wanted to ask before I ask a couple? I appreciate the uh, thought. Uh, not at the present. Thanks, though. Okay. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, so I'll just go through these page by page, just real quick. Just um, part of it's for sort of general edification of folks and part of it's for my lack of understanding. The question came up to me, traffic safety camera fines, um, we're projecting a much more modest number there. It's always good for us to um, shoot low and then be pleasantly surprised. I just wanted to know if we have any further thoughts on trends there, but I, I think I may have to defer on that one relative to the chief unless Mr. Hill, you have a thought. Um, 700, roughly 700 and change below projected for 2021 and 2022. I just want to highlight and make note that the reason why the 2021-2022 traffic uh, fines are projected at the level that they are was because of uh, what we would define as a one more of a one-time event which was uh, during the pandemic, um, everybody was at home. And then on March 8th, when the kids returned to school, um, apparently the, the, all of the notice to provide to say, please be aware these cameras are turning back on in the school zones. Um, it, it, we, it, that was a, that was, we were re-educating <laughs> drivers at that point sure. to obey within the school zone. And just the other point during that time is we had a completely different cohort model at the schools. And so we only had like about 30 minutes that, that those cameras would have been turned off. And so the decision was made at that time to just leave them on throughout the day, which caught some people off guard. But then on top of that, you know, flashing signs, um, we had people who were getting, you know, eight citations in there. So it was really... As Director Vaughn pointed out, it, it, for whatever reason, after a year of the pandemic was really just kind of teaching people, I think, less traffic on the roads. People just felt emboldened to keep going quickly. And we don't anticipate, and I don't think we've heard since school is back in now that we are, we're seeing that same type. Um, I do have one anecdote from one of our officers who was out there and saw the camera flash. 
one of you may have recited this to us, but you know, stop the individual on the street and had a discussion about that. I think that was you, yeah. Deputy yeah. Mayor. So, but for the most part, we okay. haven't heard that from the police or the courts that we're seeing what we saw during the pandemic. Okay, so the trend is is is, is pretty put puts us back to where we were prior to the pandemic. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to make sure that uh, observationally, it seems it's, it's impo almost impossible to tell, but it seems like still kind of a staggering number as I'm walking around out there. Um, the next question that I had was, um, well, I'm going to skip this one for a second, but the question uh, about uh, on, on point, uh, Deputy Mayor? Yes, please, Mr. Furtani. Okay. Um, at one point last uh, council, there was the idea of uh, shifting all the um, traffic uh, traffic camera fines into its own account, so that that would be, that account would be earmarked for uh, traffic safety improvements. Um, is that an appropriate thing to bring up here, or do we do that at some other point? That's an excellent question. I just I want to clarify that if if there was a misunderstanding there, my intent has been for us to try to figure out a way to slowly wean ourselves off of the existing camera revenues and any new re camera revenues would be going into some sort of fund that funds additional traffic camera safety, uh, traffic safety improvements throughout the community. Um, the intent was not to try to whole scale uh, shift us away from the, the traffic camera revenue that's existing because it's uh, it is uh, it is part of part of the, the way the budget has been processed here over the last couple of biennium. But again, I I think um, all of us would be quite happy, um, you know, if if the revenues were zero on these cameras, that means people are doing doing well. But that means we have to come up with some real creative ways of of funding the city. So, um, and, and those are not at hand at the moment. So um, does that help council member? Thank you, Tracy, for the question. Yeah, yeah please. I just <coughs> want to note for the record that um, with the revenue that comes in for these traffic safety cameras, uh, about 50% of that goes out into a fee that we pay for a vendor, not to mention that every single camera that, or every single, excuse me, ticket that is actually issued right. is uh, reviewed by our officers, our police officers, and then our court has to process every single one of those tickets. So in, a, in addition to the direct costs, there are some softer costs that would be a little bit harder to um, pinpoint down. But I, I want to make note that this revenue source does is tied to some significant expenditures on the other side um just for note thank Keep you that in mind thank you very much for that Thanks. and that's really important to understand because it's at least at least 50 percent, as i understand it so if, if not more um and um so that is that is very that is very important to, to recognize um let's see uh page 34 and this is a question that I just thought of last night, um, and that was about REIT. Let's see, so page 34, uh, REIT showing a decline because of decline in um, uh, uh, property sales have gone down considerably already, and they will probably continue to, to go down at a rapid pace. But the question in my mind was, are we going to be receiving any REIT from uh, the transaction on the mall, or was that strictly an equity deal and not over, not over the, okay, darn. <laughs> in a great world, the mall would sell every other one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I knew the answer, but I was going to ask anyway. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, I just, for note there, we on, on REIT, uh, consistently previously in the past, it's always been our city's practice to budget that very conservatively right. and then expand it when we know for a fact that the revenue will track and trend because these are this one's um this one's a little bit harder and more challenging to budget and we just want to make sure that we do it cautiously so that's more of the history behind the lower number this is one that we always typically go into adopting a budget on the lower side sure. and then hopefully as part of the mid buy we're having the conversation to increase it. Indeed, thank you, Director Vaughn. And uh, the mayor will recall that 12 Degrees North was an interesting property. It turned over 
two times, and and the the re, the REIT that uh, windfall from that to the city was substantive and and really helped us out with a lot of programs. So um, I agree with you, Mayor. Maybe every other year we can have them all change hands, and, <laughs> and we might get some new signs every time. You know. Um, okay. Thank you for that. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Well, let, let me pause here and we'll go around the horn again. Councilman Riddle, you are looking like you have a, another one. Yeah, I think I've got two comments here. Um, one question about the sales tax revenue trend. Um, I know we were concerned about that revenue being significantly impacted by the pandemic, but due to reasons, it wasn't actually that bad. Is the trend that is being presented for the sales tax revenue, is that consistent kind of outside of any anomaly from the pandemic? Yeah, it's um, it's just turning up to being a little bit more consistent for what we have seen, but still a little bit um, erred on the side of a little bit of caution because it can, um, that's one too that is, there's some revenues that you do have to, we, we are following the trend, that being said, err on the side of just a little bit of caution. Of course, of course. Thank you for that clarification. And if I can just add to that, you know, it, it was always trending slightly up during the pandemic mm -hmm. and point of sale change in the sales tax law. We saw that trend start to increase slightly, mm -hmm. but with only a few years of data, we don't want to assume that that trend will continue at the pace that it started. Yeah. And so as Director Vaughn pointed out, it's, it, it's conservative, but it is trending up still. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, that's what I. That's what I thought you were putting together. So it's, it's great to hear that confirmation. And then there is. Um, I'm curious. I went through the. Uh, can I move into expenditures yet, or do we want to stay in revenue for a little longer? Um. Let's see. Where are we here? Go. Go right ahead. Is that okay? We can, we can jump around a little bit. This we can is jump kind around. Of more. Um, <laughs> and if there's a, a colleagues, I'm sorry. Um, just by the by, as a point of n note, if there are questions that you think might be helpful for other people to hear the answer to, please go ahead and ask it uh, because this is foundational for all of us if, in case we missed something. So don't hesitate. Thank you. Um, I just had a, a question if the, it doesn't look like the budget um, accounts for the possible Regional Homelessness Authority, North King County reach, uh, interlocal agreement that has been presented um, by the RHA, is that a true? Have we not incorporated that um, into the budget at this point? So that is not part of the budget because there has not been a policy discussion around that. If you remember, we took a portion of the county sales tax. I think we get 12,000 a year. Yeah. Is that about 12,000 a year? And we've been banking that for a couple of years, but that would require a policy discussion of the council. Um, once that ILA is prepared is if the city is going to participate in providing funds um, for homeless services. And if that's the revenue source that you want to use for that and in that dollar amount. And so until we have that, we, we weren't going to include that in this budget, but the dollars are in going into a line item and tracked. And they're, and they're being tracked and, and not utilized, as far right. as I understand, because they were we cannot earmarked for yeah, essentially they, that. Yeah, the law function. states that it goes towards housing. Perfect. Um, and then lastly, I've just happened to notice in the um, salaries uh, section, I, should, I wish I could give you num page numbers easier, but um, in the budgeted salaries, there doesn't appear to be in, um, a difference in the budget of salaries for the public works between 23 and 24 is that in, is that part of the is that part of where we kind of ended with because we don't have an agreement at this time and so we're just holding you just nailed it Perfect. that is okay. exactly where i was going to to go um there currently is not an agreement so therefore um this is staying static to what it currently is okay um and we are hopeful that we will get to an agreement prior to the adoption of this budget. Okay, so there's no increase in either 23 or 24 at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Councilor Riddle. Councilor Goldman, Councilor Levo. Thank you. 
um, as talking about revenue under licenses and permits, we've talked about increasing the um, building and mechanical electrical. Does this budget account for any of those proposed uh, rate increases? I did work with Calvin, our building official, on those revenue numbers. I honestly would have to circle back with him to see if raising those numbers, if he would feel differently about increasing or, or modifying them. And if I'm going to pass it over to city administrator. No, because I have a question for you then. I thought that are the numbers that are in there now based on his original numbers prior to the discussion with council to go back and look at that? That is my understanding. We're all over each other with these microphones. We will go back and double check it. It was our understanding that what is in this budget was what Calvin recommended to you at that first meeting, there was some requests from the council, go back and double check those. And if what we present and the council adopts is higher than what's built in this budget, then those would be brought in here. So, but I know that he and director Perigo are working on that right now. Okay, that would be helpful because that would, uh, going back to the earlier conversation, what do we actually have to do in order to see that revenue? So we would have to pass a resolution in order to see the revenue. Yes, you, an, a resolution would have to be passed in, if we're increasing it in 2022, and then again, we would, uh, no, I actually did mean 2022, and then again in 2023, if it changed from there. Okay. So there's so, a, so there are a series of things that are in this budget that are dependent upon council passing certain resolutions to raise uh, certain fees or taxes. So I probably should just pause on that and, okay. and circle back okay. would be the wisest. Okay. Thank you. So it sounds like that would be part of our, our lever discussion and uh, we can make sure that we have clarity on that. Um, and, and see what kind of methods we have here in the mix to um, increase revenues. Um, well, it wouldn't be to increase revenues. It would just be to- um, Oh, if we're recouping our costs. Well, it, it would be to reflect the revenue that's projected in the mayor's budget it is dependent upon the council taking certain actions on resolutions to raise taxes and fees. Well, I understand that, but I was, yeah, it, they should be in my, in my mind that if it's dependent upon and thank you, Lindsay, for not doing math on TV. If it's dependent upon, dependent upon, if this budget is dependent upon certain lever, levers, I keep saying levers, um, then we should, those should be highlighted and for sure, each of those types of things. And if not, we should, I mean, we should, to a certain degree, I feel like we should almost have it scrubbed out so that when we have the lever discussion, we can say yes, no, and this is the ultimate effect going forward. There are some assumptions baked in, I know. Um, so, does that close the loop on that a little bit? Just to give you guys an idea, I mean, I, I went over this with Calvin, our building official, months ago. <laughs> I mean, when we started this, the revenue discussions, I think it was probably back in July. Um, so it was it was a while ago when he was working on those codes. But I would, I, I do need to provide the courtesy of circling back with him to confirm if because I do also know he was working towards bringing everything that he has brought forward um, with the intent to raise the rates, but I think it's worth a pause in order to bring back to make sure. Fair enough, thank you. Thank you for that. I'm making, making sure that we're not um, mixing apples and oranges here on a couple of things. Mr. Lebo, did you have a, another follow-up to that one? Okay. Um, I just wanted to come back to uh, just a general quick conversation about fund balance reductions. Um, page 38, we have the general fund is gonna be reduced by $1.2 million. We have a huge increase of, uh, in um, overall insurance costs. And, and we it's a big hit and uh, we're not unique to that particular hit. It's, 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 Everyone is, is suffering from this particular situation. I just wanted to mention that while we are above the 16% th um, reserve threshold that we have set, we set for ourselves a number of years ago, 
I do know that it does give some members of the public a little bit of consternation and makes them uncomfortable when we look at uh, dipping into um, unallocated um, ending fund balances. But I wanted to say just for the record that when a, more than a decade ago, when the mayor and I joined the council, those reserves were in, in really bad shape as well as the number that was required at the time. Mayor, do you remember it was 10 percent it was a lot lower um, yeah i thought it was i thought it was 11 but is it maybe 11 thank you yeah yeah and so i just want to remind uh, um not only for members of the public but also for everyone's edification that that we have increased those reserve requirements through policy change and you can look at our comprehensive financial policies at the back at the in the appendix of, of the of the uh budget document um but I'm, I'm comforted by that level that we're above the 16% uh, number. And um, at the same time, I'd like us to think about as we're going through our discussions and we come to provisos, if we're budgeting certain kinds of things that are um, the color of the money, if you will, which is probably a bad way to, to put it, is commensurate with uh, the, the, the revenue exceeds what we expect our projections that some of these things um, maybe go back into the appropriate fund if we are having to draw down certain places um, and I do recognize these are unallocated so you know in general fund the color of it is very green so it's very different than another place with that um, and we're not in looking at any kind of significant reductions in restricted funds so but I wanted to throw that out there because if we do err on the side. If we're erring the side of being conservative on our revenue projections, then um, maybe there's some ways to make sure that we um, give the public a little bit of satisfaction of putting some money into additional reserve spaces, whether it's council contingency or whatever else, if we enjoy a, a revenue windfall. And by windfall, I mean, it's probably going to be pretty slight. So Mr. Goldman. Um, yes, on that same page with fund balances, um, at the very bottom, the new IT fund is projected to have a negative balance of negative 27,000. And I'm just wondering, how can that be? Uh, be because we currently, that is a first, that is a good question, a great question. Um, so it currently doesn't show a beginning fund balance because we were proposing to create that fund this year. Um, but before the, the budget is adopted, the intent would be to move some of the money in from the vehicle and equipment replacement fund, which is currently where that fund resides. So it would be to move um, an allocated a certain dollar amount into the IT equipment replacement fund in order so that would that fund then would have a positive fund balance at the end, but would stand alone. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Furtani, I didn't want to make, I want to make sure that I'm not missing you here. Any, any follow-ups or questions or comments? Yeah, again, I don't know if this is the appropriate time to do it, but I've only booked this room for an hour and it's starting to get into the second half hour here. So I'll ask it, um, but the, uh, under the, uh, uh, procedures for setting up the budget. Um, we're having our informal discussions right now. When is an appropriate time to bring up amendments or pro other provisos that the you know council wants to bring forward? That's a great question, council member. And what I was gonna suggest, and I was gonna have this, I was gonna mention this. How about I talk about that a little bit at the latter part of the meeting? Right now is, is uh, you certainly can, certainly can mention it, but if you wanna make, um, uh, I'm going to request that council members uh, send in topics, very specific topics for discussion here that I can aggregate. It's going to be one of those situations where you don't, you send it only to me, I'll put it together in a spreadsheet. And then uh, we will, I will hand it off to staff if there's any research that needs to be done. And then we'll, when we come back as a body, we can have a conversation about those topics uh, that each of us uh, potentially has in the mix. Uh, that's been kind of our methodology in the past, if, if uh, unless somebody has a better better approach. It sounds really good. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, colleagues, other other questions? I had a quick question about um, 
and this is just off the cuff, so I could dig for it. Where is a radar being funded from, uh, Direct um, Administrator Hill? Is that from what was that? We're going to bank that from ARPA. It's was supposed that to be funded from ARPA okay. funds just, during this biennium and the following biennium. Okay. Um, to give us four years Push. to figure out if there's a larger funding source or a, a different right. funding source at a more regional level. Right. Okay. Thank you. So, colleagues, do you have any questions about that? Is basically we're putting this money aside from the ARPA, the federal ARPA funds, to ensure, regardless of what kind of grant opportunities we have, we have funds set aside to make sure that's. It's it's expressing our commitment to the program, really. Mr. Levo? Just that um, as a six-year agreement or a six-year commitment, while it's funded for the first four years, that's that last biennium we'll have to find money for. And we're committed to finding money for it once we sign up. Yes, indeed. Um, I, I hope hope with some of the announcements that keep coming down the pike, like there was a, few, a couple of good announcements today, that there will be additional funding sources for writing these programs, I hope, but we'll see, see what happens. That's an excellent point, thank you. Other thoughts or questions here? Let's see, I've got all these covered. Um, fines, transfers. Yeah, that was my list. Anyone else? Did you guys, do you all want to uh, dig into some topical things right now that are top of mind? We could start, rather than sending them in, Mr. Furtani, if you want to mention something that you're interested in, we can start making a list at this, at this time. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, one of them is basically about the, um, and I appreciate this very much, Mr. Mayor, I can't see you, but uh, I do appreciate the fact that you're uh, funding okay. the Climate Action Committee to $30,000 uh, $30, for this next biennium. Um, so to, speaking with Ken Moore's uh, um, climate folks, um, they spent somewhere between sixty and 100000 for their complete uh, climate action plan. And um, boy, I'm not suggesting that we uh, are as large as Ken Moore or as diverse in terms of the different kinds of climate actions they were taking. I'm, I'm thinking that um, given our timeline for the committee, we're pretty much going to have a complete plan by the end of 2024. So I'm thinking basically maybe we might need to up it in the second year. So if we think of the 30,000, a split is 15, 15 between the two years, that second year might need a 20 or so to actually get the plan over the finish line. So just a thought that I had about that. Mr. Fur Tony, for clarification, an additional 20 or? No, no, uh, to, to, uh, 15 to 20. So another, an additional five. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. I, I suspect we, we would be able to find that someplace here. Colleagues, other thoughts? Councilman Riddle. Um, I have a, a couple of thoughts. Um, one is, as I mentioned before, if we move forward with the Regional Home Associates Authority, ILA is making sure that that gets, uh, the policy gets set for that and the amount of time that we have. Um, of course, that depends a lot on when that ILA gets, you know, approved or gets to the point where it can be approved by us. But um, I want that on the horizon. Um, we do have an art policy, uh, which does allow us to do that 1% um, uh, art fund or, or art reserved money for art. Um, so I think it would be, a, so to speak, low hanging fruit since the, the policy is in place and has been since 2000, um, is to start um, officially banking that 1% as we move forward. Um, that has budget implications, of course, because uh, all the capital project funds, then we'd have that extra 1%, which would then be um, secured away into, into a, a art reserve. So we'd have to have a policy discussion, I think, if we want to move forward with that, but I would love to have that conversation. Um, and then I know it might not seem like much, but I didn't see the pet parade in our budget this year. And um, I really appreciated that. And I know it was something that um, our former colleague, um, uh, John Wright, was really, really excited by. And I know that perhaps it may not uh, live in this exact same way, but I would love to see some version of that kind of uh, maybe get integrated with one of our other events as, as, a, as a part of that. So um, I thought that was a really fun and uh, community building event. 
and we still haven't seen miniature horses. So, um, so those were a few things. And then lastly, is if we, uh, to start thinking about uh, what it would cost to do the prep with the community if we decide to endeavor into a levy lid lift and to start um, having that discussion with the community next year to see if there are specific projects that they would support, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm just trying to think here. Does anyone recall off the top of their head what the pet parade cost, Mayor? <laughs> it was before, I remember, I think it was like $5,000. Like I'm. That's a lot for uh, doggy bags. I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm not really sure that that would, I really don't remember. I'll ask Corey, but you know, we'll just put it in. It'd be a good start to picnic in the parade. I'm picnic in the park the that were back and you know, shovels walk through there the and we're going to, you know, she's going to bring her biting pony. So that'll be good. Um, <laughs> well, and I will look into that some more too, because I really had a lot of interest in uh, maybe adding a car show to that. So I'll talk to, I would talk to Corey and, um, but we'll look into that, but. I just, sounds like fun. Yeah. So we'll, we'll ask Corey and see, but. Horses we'll and look. horsepower. Ooh. That's there really go. good. Ooh. That's pretty good. Cool. We need to get into well, marketing. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> uh, well, thank, thank you both. Well, maybe, maybe Mayor too, we could, we could think about um, just sort of an additional, uh, as you've highlighted, Mr. Mayor, that people need to get out and, and, and do more thing, be able to have more opportunities. Maybe we need to increase some of the, these, event kinds of thematic things. Um, I think I, I really love that idea. And by the way, I, I heard from another city that um, if you are part of this group, and Corey probably is aware of this, you can, um, if you hire one of the, the performing artists out of this group, musician, whatever else, out of this pool of people, that's a, a regional thing, uh, there's a nonprofit that will, will match half of the, the cost uh, to if it's within that group um, because they're trying to support struggling artists and it's a, it's uh, funded by uh, donations and grants and things like that. So it's kind of an interesting group as well. Um, another thought in terms of, you know, if so if it's $2,000, they'll, they'll pay for like a thousand of it. It's one of the musicians that's supported by that organization. Um, okay, great. Um, Mr. Lebo, Mr. Goldman, anyone else want to jump? Go ahead. Um, yes, thanks. Um, so a uh, follow-up from something that I mentioned at a previous meeting is just ensuring the, that we have enough in our budget for pedestrian safety improvements. And I've spoken with Director Perigo and Administrator Hill. Um, I'm thinking of the cost of replacing speed limit signs, doing the speed limit study on arterials and highways, um, installing traffic cameras, things like that. And they, um, they've they said that they believe, and um, correct me if this is no longer the case, but between the street fund and ARPA fund, there should be sufficient money to cover those. So what I expect, expressed to council member Goldman on Friday was, you know, we, I know we left you a whopping almost $30,000. You know, if you go back to my original slide, but in that there was 200,000 for street improvements. The administration did not identify what those street improvements would be. So between those two combinations of funding, if that's a priority for the council, I think there's dollars there to do that. That's thank you. That that is very very helpful, and thank you, Councilmember Goldman. I was I was going to uh, actually bring that up a later point, but I didn't know what the the 200k was earmarked for specifically. Please. Sort of a follow-up question. Um, I know, at, at least I think I know, our city doesn't have, we've got the flashing lights for crosswalk, um, like I'm thinking of 178th and a few other places maybe, but we don't have like actual stoplights for crosswalks that actually stop traffic that are not already at a lighted intersection. Is that a traffic safety feature that we've looked into in the past? Are we aware of its use and its regulations yet? You're speaking of like a hawk crossing type signal. Yeah, well, you hit the button and it actually stops the traffic to allow the pedestrian to walk rather than simply the flashing caution signs. I don't know that 
we've explored those in the past. I know that Hawk Crossings have significant um, capital investment. Um, they're mm -hmm. extremely expensive. Yes. Um, they're usually meant for like a mid block type of a crossing, not an intersection crossing confuses motorists and you have so many different um, yeah. traffic yeah. flows. So I don't think it's something we've looked at in the past. Yeah, I was. I just thought about it on 178th because even though it's technically not a mid block, those are, you know, they treat it like there's no cross streets up and down that road. So I just thought that might be something that, that a tool that we could look at how much it would cost and, and possibly see if there's appropriate locations. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, yeah, I, I, that's a that's a great point to. Um, I think that part of this is that because we are beginning our not beginning, we're in the midst of talking about speed limits and taking some introductory actions here coming up. Um, we haven't gotten to the traffic calming or that I think we're going to be, uh, I completely agree with you, Councilmember Furtani and I had a conversation quite a while ago about those types of crossings, particularly at the um, sort of far reaches of our community, way up by Shoreline and on 178th, as well as up near like our public works facility, where there's no crossing for blocks, literally. Um, and what I would say about, at least on the SR 104 question, that has to be in, um, part of a conversation with WashDOT and the engineering is more substantive on that than a, an arterial. But that certainly could be part of a safe, um, safe uh, streets project. Uh, safety study that we're going to be having to do anyway, and we can make sure that that's included in the mix for arterials as well as our state routes. Um, I'm hoping we can find a way, and this is taking back off our conversation last week at our Committee of the Whole, that we will be able to hire a consultant that will be able to, to enca encapsulate what we really need to do without doing a whole bunch of separate engineering studies for to satisfy the requirements of the state uh, et cetera. So, um, and uh, including, you know, the equity analysis that's necessary for certain kinds of traffic camera placements. Um, uh, so actually required from any of the new traffic camera placements that are in the new areas, the hospital zone, et cetera. Um, I'm sorry, it's only for speed cameras. I'm conflating two things here. For speed cameras, actually for, um, for ad hoc speed cameras. So there has to be an equity analysis there. Um, so the question we have to ask ourselves, is the 200K plus the 30,000 some odd in there going to be enough to do what we are going to try to accomplish here coming down the line? I had thought that potentially next year, um, I, you know, or as we get more clarity on what the will of this body is in terms of additional um, projects that we might be able to do some um, consider doing a budget amendment in terms of utilizing a little bit of ARPA funds to get those projects rolling as well. So um, the need is there for sure. So I won't go down that rabbit hole right now, but any thoughts on comments on point, Mr. Lebo? So speaking of that, um, I would like to see us um, not just do street overlays, but when we uh, repave streets that we think of in terms of whole streets. And that is for pedestrians and bicyclists, not just for cars. And I would like to see the city come back with a plan about how we can generate or create safe passages or walkways uh, across the Lake Forest Park. We have uh, several arterials that um, a couple of them are not safe to walk on. And um, there are less expensive ways to, to provide safe walk paths other than just sidewalks, such as concrete curbs that will separate the traffic from uh, the pedestrians. And I'd like to see a plan uh, about how and what we're gonna pave, uh, because I'm not entirely convinced that Northeast 35th was the street most in need of pavement. I was very pleased to see that they are incorporating um, concrete curbs there to create safe passages for pedestrians. But also in looking at uh, $400,000 for ADA ramps, I am not in favor of spending $400,000 in ADA ramps, which is more than the cost of the overlays. Thank you. Um, 
a couple of things, and I will certainly defer to the experts on this because I am not one in this any shape or form on this regard. Um, the ADA ramps, some of those, we have to show progress from the federal government stand, standpoint. So Mr. Perigo, can you just touch on that brief, briefly here? It, it, it may be a broader policy discussion or, you know, so not if that's. Uh, yeah, thank you. When, you. when you do paving, you have to do the ramps if their ramps exist. So that is a federal mandate and that's obviously meet requirements as far as slopes and those sorts of things. But if I understand that, mm -hmm. and as you know, I was not pleased with the ones that were done this past year. I am aware. And uh, Northeast 35th doesn't have any uh, ADA ramps that need to be replaced. So I'm just curious about, and this is why I'd like to see what a plan is to understand whether or not we are going to spend $400,000 on ADA ramps if we're going to do streets that don't have curb cuts, because then you don't need to redo the curb cuts because they don't exist. Correct. If they do not exist, then you, don't, you do not need to place them. Right. But a plan would demonstrate what you need. And so I'm, I'm one of those that if we want to uh, have a budget and ask for money, that we demonstrate what the need is, rather than just put numbers into a budget. So what is your proposal in terms of a plan? Like the city to develop a plan for what they Consider to, <laughs> I'd I'd like a I would like a uh, a plan that shows what the overlay program is and a plan that shows how we provide uh, safe pedestrian access. We do have the state uh, safe streets plan, which did identify arterials, which does include different methodologies for providing safe paths for pedestrians. I would like to see that integrated into a plan. Yeah, and it looks like I do get red so I can talk. Um, well, also, what I'm hearing from Council Member Lebo is to look at the upcoming biennium. We've put money in for ADA ramps. If we do not need that, then could the council allocate, you know, if the roads we're going to overlay don't require ADA ramps, then can we allocate that to make the further improvements so we can take a look at that? Uh, no, I, I'm asking for a plan. So. Well, yeah. That is, yeah. So it's not a question of just because we have money, we spend it, but what is the plan before we spend it? And then to your point, uh, Council Member Lee, we are looking to try to have a five-year plan for our paving. Once we get our uh, PCI values re-upped, we can have a better uh, approach to uh, address those streets that are in most need for, for repaving and then incorporate the, the ramps as needed. So for those who aren't traffic engineers, what's PCI? A pavement condition index, which is the a rating for the for the pavement. Okay, thank you. You've been waiting patiently. Um, yeah, well, on point with this, um, I fully recognize that when something's a federal requirement, we have to do it. It leaves a bad taste in my mouth because effectively roads that have kind of basic curb ramps get better curb ramps, and then roads that don't have anything continue to not have anything. And so if we are going to be developing a plan about where are we going to be doing work around the city, just making sure that that money is spread all the way around the city and not just upgrading existing facilities. Mr. Furtani. Yes, and uh, on point with uh, what both uh, John and Larry said, um, I'm interested in seeing, uh, like I mentioned uh, last meeting, um, the Parks Board is coming up with great walks of LFP. And the point being that all these uh, improvements we're talking about, including safety uh, on for pedestrians and bicyclists, as, as well as a lot of the um, uh, street uh, um, street demonstration that's we're going to do. Uh, I'd like to see them basically in one area. So uh, sort of going away from what Larry said, you know, spreading out is great, but at the same time, I think it's it's kind of important to show holistically how the uh, all these improvements are going to add on to each other synergistically, so that we actually have some place where people feel comfortable walking, biking, whatever the modality they use. So and I really like to see basically a plan on the part of the city to say, okay, we're going to take this part and actually do something completely with it. Thank you, council member. Um, I, I would just offer a couple things that I do support Larry's uh, council member Goldman's idea that we should spread around Lake Forest Park 
uh, our improvements. Um, I think there are many areas of Lake Forest Park that were incorporated later on than some other areas and their uh, improvements or infrastructure are not equal to some of the areas that we have around the city center. And in talking to many people around Lake Forest Park, it's very important that they recognize the value of their tax dollars going to their area in addition to just the city center. I, several people said, it appears as though all the money gets spent around the triangle near the um, town center. The other is I would encourage the city to develop six year plans that uh, correspond to our budget process rather than a five year plan. Thank you, Mr. Lebo. Yes, our, our friend, uh, Ann, who lives way up, I say our friend collectively, <laughs> Mr. Furtani's <laughs> nodding his head, has been a, a very vocal advocate for the North, let's see, is that North corner of the community that has really a, a very um, a meager amount of improvements on, on the roads there. Mr. Furtani, did you have a follow-up? I did. And I didn't want to slight anybody in the city saying that we're, we're going to favor one particular part. I'm suggesting that with the amount of money we have, we're going to be spread pretty thin in terms of improvements all across the city. And, you know, these small incremental steps are important, but I think at the same time, we need to make a bolder statement about how we're going to do the pedestrian and bicyclist safety thing correctly with basically accommodating vehicle traffic. That's, that's the only point I wanted to make. Yeah, I, I think what I'm hearing from Councilmember Furatani is we don't want to do a half job everywhere. We want to make sure if we're going to invest in that street, that it becomes a valuable asset for that community, that it fully functions for pedestrians, for bicyclists, for cars before we move on to the next sort of area. And I think that's what I'm hearing is we don't want to do a whole neighborhood and focus all our time, but we want to make sure when we touch an area as Councilmember Lewa said, well, if you're, re if you're doing the overlay, what about the pedestrian sort of aspect to that street? So I think it's thinking about the street and all of its mobility needs when we touch it and then moving on to another other equitable area of the city and doing the same thing. That's kind of what I'm hearing, if I could interpret that. Um, do I see nods of what that was? Okay. Yeah. I, I think we missed the equity issue and that there are places where we have an arterial where children are trying to get to bus stops and there is literally no place for them to walk. They're in the ditch. And for us to say, um, we, we can't do anything because we've got to make the street uh, have sidewalks and trees and other improvements, I think misses the opportunity uh, that we should be able to have uh, equitable improvements across Lake Forest Park in ways that do allow people to get out. I mean, I, I'm very appreciative of the fact that the city is putting curbs along Northeast 35th because I talked to several people there that said they won't walk along Northeast 35th because they consider that to be a dangerous road. So I, I'm not a fan of spending a lot of money in a small area when we have so many things that we wanna do. I think, though, that if we can show the citizens that we are spending our money in efficient, practical ways, then we can justify going to them and asking them for more money to actually provide safe passage for people across Lake Forest Park. But if we just build a sidewalk, then they will recognize right away that we're either asking for too much money or we're not asking for enough money because <clears throat> we can't figure out a, a reasonable, cost-effective way to do it. And that's so often I see as as plan. I mean, Bothell will have a levy for uh, safe streets in their overlay program. And if you look at the amount of feet that they pay for or construct for sidewalks, it's very small. In response, I don't think anything I said implied everyone would get a sidewalk. I just want to be very clear. I think the intention is, and our I know that our public works department and, and so they're very clear about not overspending. The city's money it's what is appropriate for that city but taking into consider all consideration all the modalities that we'll be using that individual area and making sure we don't only get halfway that we actually address the needs of that whether that's additional striping whether that's curb whether that's a full sidewalk if we're talking about real close to you know the, the elementary schools or something I, i'm not suggesting a particular level just that we make sure we meet the need of that street before we move on to the next one Sorry, Councilmember Furtani. 
Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, and, and Council Member Lee, I was not implying either that, you know, we needed sidewalks everywhere. The concern that I had mostly was that we don't, we avoid those unintended consequences where if we do some improvements and we funnel people to an unsafe place, that's really what I want to avoid is basically doing, as uh, Council Member Riddle was saying, um, if, if we're going to do the job, we should do it correctly so that we don't end up in a situation where we just put people at more risk because of some things that we did halfway. Thank you, Council Member. Mr. Goldman. Yeah, so um, I, I agree with what people are saying. Um, I would like to see data because I think anecdotally, we've all heard from residents who are frustrated with how much they are paying into the city and how much they're receiving in terms of services or work. If there was a way where we could get some data, you know, look at neighborhood by neighborhood and actually quantify, well, the, let's say, Horizon View neighborhood, how much have those houses put into our property tax and other taxes, and then what level, like how, like how much work has been done in that neighborhood. That way we could kind of have a visualization of where has the city kind of been overspending and where has the city been underspending and use that as a part of the, a metric to, for future investments. I'm, I, I'm not sure how easy or hard it would be to get that data, but I would be very interested in seeing it. Thank you, council member. Um, I think that the all excellent points and I really, uh, really, enjoy this discussion because I think it's it's something that's it's top of all of our minds and trying to figure out what we can do with the scarce resources that we have. Mm -hmm. um, I would suggest on this topic, um, we're tying a couple of things together, thinking about future, you had mentioned, uh, both of you have mentioned um, going back to the public at some point with discrete series of projects. Uh, and I I think this body is going to have to decide whether or not um, we are going to be able to come up with enough resources to come up with that list and the basic design. I'd invite you to take a look at um, City of Shoreline's parks levy from earlier in the year uh, that shows a number of basic projects that they funded through uh, uh, through their levy, uh, or they were proposing to fund through the levy and they will. And I believe that that is kind of, in my mind, is kind of the level of detail that we're gonna have to get to, to take it to, to the voters at some point and say, this is what, what we need to do. So a couple of things. I personally believe that it, during this budget process, we can lay the groundwork for the preliminary work for that, some initial, whether it's a study, whether, you know, um, uh, taking a look at inequities across the community and where things are not there uh, or where there's real real need, needs as well as some data analysis and data, data gathering and analysis. Um, and then I think next year we're going to have to probably earlier early in the year figure out whether it makes sense for us to be utilizing, for example, some of the ARPA funds to get ourselves additional ARPA funds that we haven't uh, banked away to get us to a place having a number of discrete projects that, that the, the public can say, yes, it is necessary for us to have this curb here or this sidewalk here or this crossing here or this. Um, I think it's too big. I, I believe it's too big a task, of course, during, during this process, but I believe that there's an opportunity for us in the new year to do that. As much as I'd like to see some, some immediate gratification for the community relative to, um, you know, a additional curbage here, or crossings or things like that, it's possible it may be better for us to be utilizing the resources that scant resources that we have to think forward for so that we can say to the community, do you believe that these five, six, seven projects are something that you're willing to fund? You know, maybe one is a series of crossings, maybe one is a series of um, an additional curbage uh, along the various roads so people feel safer there. Um, we certainly all agree that there are some really dangerous arterials out there that, that need improvements. And it's the question of getting, getting those um, projects to a level that is one, understandable by the public, but two, also is something that we can um, make sure we can um, bond for as well. So, 
Uh, yes, Councilmember Fertani. Thank you. Um, I have to leave, but uh, just a closing thought on this was that um, I think we have a consensus that regardless of what the discussion, as you say, in next year is going to be about the larger potential bond issue, um, that for the ne next biennium, it'd be great to see a plan of what the city is actually going to, which projects the city is actually going to tackle. And, uh, you know, as, as Councilmember Lebo was uh, saying, it's, you know, hard to basically fund something that we don't really know what they're going to do. So one thing I would respect respectfully ask is if we could get some idea of which streets and which neighborhoods uh, that the current budget is going to actually do things for. Thank you, Councilmember Fertani. Uh, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. And if you have to go, I, I fully recognize that. But thank you for, uh, for joining us there. Uh, and just a quick question. Did you watch the impact today? Absolutely. It was fabulous. It was yes. It was uh, it was pretty neat. Uh, if, if anybody hasn't didn't see it, pretty cool. So well, thank you. Have a great rest of your evening, and we'll we'll see you very soon. Take care. Uh, Take care. Thank you. So maybe what I'm hearing here, and we can talk about this a little bit more, is that um, there does seem to be a general consensus here coming up with a. Yeah, go, go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I can hear you, see you back you there. Know, the, the, the sad part about this, and Tom and I got in office, we inherited a town that didn't even want sidewalks. That was not the thought of the, um, the past councils and stuff. The city wasn't designed for, for sidewalks. It just wasn't. And that's, we've been told that by older council members. That was not what they were worried about. You know, we have elementary schools without sidewalks. And the problem, we have, I totally agree with everything. I've been doing this 12 years. I grew up right in the Northwest corner, right there in Mount Lake Terrace. I rode my bike down that road. Those people need a sidewalk. Every, every corner should have a way for somebody to walk all the way down to town center. I've been fighting and wanted that for 12 years. That road up there has a nice ditch all the way along it. So that road, that project to put a sidewalk along that road, which is half far as the other half is shoreline, um, that's gonna be an expensive one. But those people deserve it. They don't even have a park up there. So, you know, it's going to be, it's, it's a big haul and we need to figure it out. And equity is a big deal. Those people, most of us weren't in Lake Forest Park. A few of us actually left it, lived in Lake Forest Park, but a lot of us got annexed. I can see my house from here and I was one of the last annexes in 94. So, um, yeah, we inherited a lot of King County property. We inherited the property and it's, it's a pain, but I applaud that you guys want to move forward and we would do whatever we can, but I, I know we can't ask people for money unless we give them a plan, but you got to have to do a lot of work to what is equitable for what neighborhood. And that's going to be the hard part. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and just on point, uh, going down Amnesia Lane here, uh, the first new sidewalk in 30 years was the little strip between the two bus stops here as part of our culvert replacement project, which was not originally included in it. And uh, I advocated incredibly hard as, as the mayor did as well. And then ultimately, I think Mr. Uh, Mr. Rose, uh, when he said, fine, we'll, we'll include a little bit extra money to get that sidewalk in place. And then he, uh, ever since then, he's been referring to that as the Tom French Memorial sidewalk, which I'm not sure how to take that, but. Um, and then after that, we had the the 178 big project to school to Brookside School, and and um, and and so there's been additional sidewalks, but not enough. Um, and as Mr. Lebo said, it's not it's not all about the, the paving sidewalks. There's um, I've been reading uh, some really interesting articles about the um, increases in people wanting to ride their bikes on like gravel paths and things like that too. And that's that's an interesting thing to consider around the community where there's un unopened right-of-ways and things like that too. Councilman Riddle. Thank you. A thought just occurred to me and Director Perigo, I know you don't have an answer off the top of your head, but if I could uh, get you thinking about all this sort of, especially areas where we've got um, separated curb pedestrian areas. And I know sometimes those get very dirty and our street sweeper can't reach it. And I know that impacts, I think a lot of the street cyclists, the road cyclists, because they don't want to go on that because it can gather gravel and other debris. Have you put any thought into us for increasing these different types of pedestrian um, shoulders, uh, what that might, what we might need to do to make those continue to be safe in the future? I'm thinking tiny sweeper, I'm, what? 
that is actually something that I was looking at with our operations superintendent and the one that we're looking at was over a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Um, just so for a fake right? sale. Yeah. <laughs> so they're, they're relatively pricey. Um, they're very functional, but yes, that is concern that we have with the extruded curb that's on the, the pavement. Now that it does get, um, with the leaf drop and whatnot, it does get pretty, pretty okay. difficult at times to maintain that. Yeah. And so obviously that's not in this, in this budget at all, but it is something that I think we will have to tackle at some point as we start building more and more of those types of conditions. That's correct. For safety. Thank you. You know, I, I think in hearing, every, and this is just off the cuff, but in hearing everybody talk tonight, again, we're all in, in agreement that something needs to be done. And I think that maybe as part of this process, we consider putting in to the mix uh, and we don't have to define it now, a, you know, um, so, some modest amount of funds. I can't remember what it cost us to do our safe streets study. It wasn't an enormous amount of money. <clears throat> that organization that did a transport group did a, did a, a, a very good job of the public outreach, et cetera. At the same time, it was usually, it was the usual suspects that attended each of the events and there was some advocacy on some neighborhoods, uh, I think at the expense of some other neighborhoods in terms of what, um, uh, what was needed. Uh, and so maybe through this budget process, we can come up with a, an idea of a number as well, or rough number as well as a, working with the administration as well as a, a discrete set of, of out, desired outcomes from um, an examination of the community, again, looking at data, things, things like that. And um, I would say too, we're going to be doing a safe, um, uh, I'm gonna conflate all these different terms, safe roads today as part of our speed limit question. It's possible that some of the information gathered there can be pivoted right into the additional um, uh, to offset some of the costs of an additional type of study when it comes to really what we're talking about is multimodal and pedestrian accessibility around the community. And um, so we don't have to save the world right now, but let's, uh, let's definitely bookmark it and think about what is it going to look like? Is it, do we want to try to include, and we can get, we could probably reach out to somebody like Transpo or one of the other people and say, what is, um, I said Transpo, it's not, it wasn't Transpo. Mayor, do you remember who, who did the safe streets? Um, I'm in a space now. That's Farron Pierce. Farron Pierce, thank you. Yeah, Farron Pierce. Um, and they, they really have ex outstanding multimodal uh, experiences too in, in their engineering. So um, is that, should we bookmark this for subsequent discussion and, and maybe add it into the, the budget at some point? Mr. Lee, I think you were reaching for your- Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Although I caution, we, we, uh, we shouldn't just, do studies to put them on the shelves that, that we have studies and we, we can actually implement those studies. And, um, you know, as Nike said, just do it. Um, Fair enough. But I do think though, that we should have a plan such as what is our overlay plan and how do we develop our, our streets and what streets are we paving and what streets are we improving for pedestrians and look at what is our greatest need? And I think if we look at those studies, we'll, we'll find that. Okay, thank you. Councilor Riddle. Just a thought as one of the items that didn't get into this budget. Oh, sorry. Um, the, uh, the police department had uh, attempted to include uh, e-bikes uh, and it did not meet this budget. Um, but as I think again, more of, as we start developing a lot of this extra pedestrian accessibility throughout the community, I think we should revisit that. Um, if the PD has uh, a plan on how to use them, then we can, I think we should reconsider that to support uh, more community policing as we're expecting more people to be out on our streets walking, then that kind of goes hand in hand with some good community policing opportunities. Thank you, Council Member Riddle. Uh, you had mentioned that to me the other evening and I, I think that that's a great idea. Uh, my, my only caveat was exactly what you, what you said was, I would say that it's it's important to have a real program, you know, kind of established about how they're going to be utilized and commitment to the visibility and um, and moving moving around with those so the bikes don't just sit in a in a storage locker for 
period of time or get used in the summer months or something. So um, I, I do believe with more people out and about, I think it does, it's a much gentler way of, of having visibility and build community mm -hmm. uh, with the PD. So, uh, so we can start consider a trial type of program. I know the chief had asked for that um, in the previous by name as well. Oh, and it didn't make the didn't make the cut. Mr. Lebo, did you have another? Uh, just on a, um, I'm looking at the uh, fixed and capital assets, and there's some things that I would like to see us do differently. For example, on the northeast. Um, oh, I have no idea what page it is. It's the last page, just prior to the appendix. Okay. And it's the uh, fixed and capital assets. Ninety four. Thank you very much. Um, some of those projects, I. I would like to see the city um, take a different approach to them, particularly the one on Northeast 35th Avenue, um, that particular project. I would like to see them come back with a solution that's about a quarter of that or less. I've offered two guys in a weekend and some shovels and some pipe. <laughs> Okay. The, the other is, um, I see the city. Um, I'm just curious about the capital facilities improvements to City Hall. I'm used to something, and this may be uh, because I don't know the value of City Hall, that you look at your capital improvements to be about 3% of the value of the facility. And I don't know whether we're spending more or less than what we should be spending. And I don't recall where I saw it, but I thought I saw um, about $90,000 for a um, sewer camera or a stormwater camera. And I would just ask, mm -hmm. is that a desire need or could we continue to do what we are doing now, which I assume is we're contracting for that. I think your number is correct. Was it 90? It, some, some, some number in there. There's definitely that was included. Uh, Mr. Pregos, do you have, have this one? Yes, for the CCTV camera, uh, that would be $90,000 and that would be split between um, surface water as well as, no, okay, sewer. it's just sewer, excuse me. Um, but that would be um, also used for illicit discharge issues that we have. We can respond to those much more quickly um, as well as um, there's a lot of locations that we don't know where our, where the sewer lines are and the condition of those so that it could be used for doing that as opposed to outsourcing all that uh, review. It, it just goes back to, does it represent the best value for the money that we're spending? And, um, when there's already a solution such as contracting out for it, uh, I'd be curious to understand what this does that we don't already get. When you when you lose the camera on a contract basis, it's <laughs> it's it's not a an asset that you have to replace. Yeah, let, let me do so. Let me do some more digging and sort of the trade offs. Um, sure. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and this actually brings up a, an interesting thematic thing that we need to have a conversation about, but I'll, we'll, we're, we're getting to the bottom of the hour and I'd like to bookmark this for another conversation. We, um, it, it's really maintenance, a question of maintenance, maintenance and operations for our, our capital facilities, I mean, and parks, et cetera. And, um, and, you know, we can go out to the voters and we can say, we want to bond for this and whatever else, but we're not going to put MO in it. You can't put MO in that mix. So um, it's really important for this body to figure out a way. Um, and again, we can't save the world overnight. And I don't mean that to be trite or, or, or flippant, is better the right way to put it. Um, and it's trite because I said it before, but the. Um, that is something that we really need to think about because the budgets in my mind tend to be very kind of, you know, they're, they're kind of 
um, there are equations and um, the things that go undone are not usually represented here, except for if in the case of something is removed from the budget and then a subsequent uh, result of that decision. But the question about the maintenance and operations is, is a really important one because our community has been clamoring for years and years about, you know, we're not maintaining the assets that we have. And, uh, and I, I think that there may be some opportunities. There, there's some, the way I look at it is uh, there are some nice to haves in this, in this, in this budget and without shouting my off, off the cuff. Um, we're not taking care of the things that we do have. So it might be a good idea for us to kind of figure out some trade-offs here as we go down the line and increase some additional expenditures for um, through public works to make sure that we have the maintenance and operation capabilities that we really, really need. Fully recognizing that we have an unfilled position in, in public works. We had a very difficult time, almost an impossible task, not we, they did, of hiring seasonal workers. So I'll leave it there, Mr. Goldman. Um, somewhat related, um, we have about three and a half million dollars of unfunded capital projects that we're hoping to get grants on. And I think we should have a discussion. Um, what do we do if we don't get grants or we only get some grants? That Does that mean the project gets shelved? Um, do we try to find other ways, maybe a, a levy of some sort? Um, but I think it's a conversation worth having. It's uh, for the L90 culvert and the roundabout. What do we do if no grant money materializes? It's an excellent point. Uh, we're making these investments. The city has been very successful in and work incredibly hard to get grant funding. Um, you know, I think we were at, with our first culvert project, 8% investment, I can't remember, by the community, the rest was grant funding, something like that. It was less than 10% anyway, uh, on a massive project. Um, it does not mean that we will always be able to be that successful, and, and, but, but it's, a, it's a point well taken. Um, we do have to continue in a pace on some of these things. Um, so that we can secure the grant funds. We have to get to certain levels and things like that. But that, um, I, so I, I will create a list of some of these additional topics that we need to a bookmark for conversations um, at a subsequent meeting here, or the next meeting actually. Other thoughts? Thank you for that, Mr. Coleman. Councilman Rudel. Less a thought, but I just uh, wanted to make note that uh, this, meeting goes to eight o'clock on the city website because oh. a special meeting they gave us a little extra time I, if we don't need it we For don't sure. need it but i wanted you to be aware of what was posted Thank on you. the website <laughs> right. um uh, what's your pleasure council uh, one of the things i would say is that this is the last meeting where it's going to be just we will have the full council back at the next meeting so um i think we've so far laid some really good groundwork and uh i would invite you to um, send in additional ideas and thoughts, potential provisos if you have them, or topics that we can categorize. Um, in the previous biennium, we had uh, five or six sort of themes that were that were grouped that, that there was a discussion about um, and interaction with the staff on specific questions. So. I can come back and I can aggregate these, I think, and digest them into something that's workable for us. But if there's additional ones, please send them to me. As always, don't uh, do a reply all in any email or, or send it out to more than <laughs> uh, one other colleague in addition to myself. Um, best not to even do that if, if, if possible. But what's your pleasure, colleagues? Would you like to continue till seven? I know the staff would probably, <laughs> I mean, to eight. Thank you. Sorry, my voice is almost gone it's because of the smoke. It's gotten pretty bad. Unless there's additional um, topics that you want to discuss. Yeah, just briefly. Um, Please. Kenmore went through a process where they were looking at the budget. And I think in COVID, they established uh, a financial sustainability advisory committee. And the role was, it was a citizen committee to look at what they were spending and to sort of say, okay, what do we need to spend? What is we'd like to spend? 
um, what would we wish to spend? And so that was a citizens group that went through and I think it was a one to two year process, but it was to look at the overall budget and say, you know, are you spending priorities right? The other is that there are cities like Shoreline and I think Bothell have a six year levy, what they call their fiscal um, sustainability plan and that they go out for a six year levy and it's really intended for O&M maintenance and operations to fund services for the city on a levy basis, not on a capital basis. Um, and I would like to encourage that we look at that as a long-term because um, there are things that we can't afford to do within this existing budget right now, such as uh, trim back some of our overgrown parks. Um, provide a minimal level of landscaping in the median of, of 522. I mean, I mean, besides the weeds. So there are other things though that going forward, such as radar and North King County uh, homeless initiatives that could fit into an operation and maintenance uh, levy as way to fund things that we otherwise wouldn't be able to fund. But that's a long-term process that somebody needs to say, we want to do it to establish that kind of uh, committee uh, to look at it. Thank you, Councilmember Lebo. Um, yes, and I think both, both Kenmore and, and, both, or, and Shoreline have done this very thing. And it is, I think the model that, I particularly like the model that Shoreline had, I think it was about an 18 month process um, and, you know, the, the um, establishment of this, such a, an advisory board or committee doesn't necessarily have to be through the budget process, but we do need to fund it and make sure it's staffed appropriately. Uh, and, and because our staff in terms of support for tree board, et cetera, is already and the parks board, et cetera, uh, is our, already over, over overburdened. Um, and so that's, that's critical. I, I fully support that. I think it's a, it's a good longer uh, type of situation, but certainly has grounds in, in the present uh, for the budget process um, for us to figure out a way to, to make that, make that happen. And, um, and I agree with you when the question of the, the M&O discussion, um, the question about being able to have a, um, you know, something that's a, inflationary um, based kind of levy like that other cities have done. What I, what I think about is since we can't combine the two, and again, this is getting, getting a little bit into the weeds here. I don't know what it is that's the best approach first, you know, going out for um, something that, that helps will hunt, help fund M&O. Um, and other additional things, probably that's the more, that's probably the, 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 the correct uh, approach or some of the more um, immediate needs that uh, are around public safety and, and improvements on the, on the capital side, but knowing full well that we're not maintaining what we have. So any other thoughts on this topic? Mr. Lebo brings up a, a really good point. I mean, I, I appreciate an operations and maintenance um, stream of, of funding that can come through. I, what I think that the um, kind of O&M levy is kind of a good way of doing it. I think engaging with our community is good. I don't know about a full, you know, community oversight group to do a review. I, I appreciate, I think a lot of our folks kind of just do that ad hoc because we have such a good budget for them to look at. But there are certainly some some missing pieces of detail that that uh, they don't get to see in this, as we've been asking for a little more detail. Um, so I'm not sure where I fall on all of that. I do know that we do need uh, operations maintenance. Um, I kind of am questioning which comes first as well. Um, I kind of like the idea of actually getting some projects out in front of people so they can see uh, that we are we are engaged in improving their experience in the community and then saying, now we gotta maintain it, you know, and um, sometimes people see that new growth, the new investment, they're more willing to, to continue to maintain, but I think it's a, we'll figure it out as we start talking about it. Mr. Goldman. Um, I'm of a civil, similar mind that 
we need to bring something before the public to vote on because just mathematically, if we can increase revenue by 1% and inflation has been more than 1% almost every year, we're losing ground. And so we need to come up with something thoughtful. Um, I'm also somewhat ambivalent about whether we go for projects or we go for maintenance, but I do think we need to bring something to the public. Yeah, thank you for that. My, my suggestion would be, um, and we, we, we touched on this during the retreat, uh, maybe we bookmark for a, a subsequent meeting here with when our colleagues return, discussion of sort of long-term funding uh, as it relates to our budgetary process now. Do we want to include an advisory board? Do we want to include monies for basic planning for certain kinds of things, estimates, get data gathering, things like that. Uh, and I think that, that I think that is an appropriate one. We certainly um, when we certainly could spend an entire meeting on that kind of topic. There's a lot, a lot there. But I think we have uh, I think we have an opportunity here in this budget to figure out a way to um, start building the case and get the put the resources in place through this budget to build the case for something that the community can wrap their arms around and uh, get behind. And, and it has to be something that's tangible. And I completely agree with you. We're, I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're in, in su such a better place than we were 10 years ago. At the same time, we're, we're starting to look at that inevitable um, structural issue that, that is, gonna, is not very far down our horizon. And we're, we're uh, we got to fund it somehow. So we can't keep doing it um, by providing um, more for less. It's just untenable. And, uh, and we certainly don't want to see levels of service cut. So other thoughts? You can certainly, again, topically send some things off to me or give me a phone call so we can be prepared for the next meeting. Um, Mr. Mayor, or did you have one, something else? I was just gonna say, I, I think perhaps um, you're sending your thoughts to the entire council, especially for those that aren't here, will help bring them up to speed on our thinking. Obviously no replying all, but I think it'd be useful to loop in uh, the council members that haven't been present um, so that they can hear our thoughts as well, just as a thought to the, my colleagues. Sure, and I know that. I'm going to say one thing. Uh, well, I think this you as the council really need to do is get out of this neighborhood and you all go up to corners of the city and meet with neighborhoods and see what people really want. We're very, the city needs more outreach. I've been here 12 years. You can have all the public meetings. You can do everything you want. And about 95% of the people never come here. I think we really need to get up to the neighborhoods and say, hey, what do you guys really want? And what do you think you need? and start talking to people face to face so they understand where you're coming from and where we're coming from that we need to do something to move the city forward. And it's not all, you know, I understand the equity thing. Um, some of us live in really nice neighborhoods and some of us don't have a sidewalk near us at all. And that's not right, but that's the way we didn't design it. But we don't, we didn't buy our houses where most of these people did. We really need to figure out a way to get actual conversations with people that never have the time to come down here are too busy just the world's that way we have 13,400 people and you see the same 300 Tom and I we've seen the same 300 people except for when the coyote got shot and when there's a tree got cut down no, otherwise yeah that's right too but you know the really we have to figure out a way to get out to the people and I will try to do more. I'm going to start with another coffee but I'm thinking about taking mine on the road just see if a neighborhood will Join up and it's not very comfortable, but I think we need to start getting out and doing that. So we need to get the message out. Great, thank you. And Lindsay, uh, Director Vaughn, is there anything that 
you need from us clarification or anything on the questions that were asked before we adjourn? I don't believe so. I've definitely taken quite a bit of notes and tried to note, <laughs> uh, I, I have pages to be precise, um, and tried to also not just make note of the question, but whose question it Me pertained well. to. Yeah. So right. we can compare um, notes as well. I have we a can bunch. compare, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so I, I think that I have a, a good overview of what has been requested also at previous meetings that work that needs to be completed and then from this meeting um, and hope to have that completed by October 13th, which is, I believe, our next meeting. So there's yes. a little break in here. That's correct. Okay. Thank you very much, Director Vaughn. Um, colleagues, <clears throat> is there anything else for the good of the order? Okay, with that, uh, we'll open up citizen comments. Matt, do we have anybody that's not asleep? One. Mr. Anderson, would you like to make public comment this evening? Uh, yes. Although, Please. Um, I, I suspect I'm one of the 300. <laughs> I think we've counted you twice, Julian. Oh, well, 301, even better. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't have prepared comments, but a couple of reactions, maybe three. Uh, first of all, appreciate for, even though it was a meandering detailed discussion tonight, that you are able to have the time to do that because I think it leads to new thoughts and uh, ultimately conclusions, not tonight, but one day. So appreciated the, you know, the breadth of the discussion. Uh, and I really like the mayor's last comment. Um, stop listening to me, although you always give me a chance to talk, which I appreciate, but find those people who care what's going on, but uh, you never hear from. Uh, and if the mayor can, Maybe you ought to do some stand up out in unusual places. And then the crowd would come and you could sneak in some city business. But anyway, I really fully agree with his point of view and, um, uh, and encourage you to do that. But the first item in my list of things to talk about was the concept of balanced budget. Uh, and I was uh, listening to Alan Keese the other night and really thinking that different people have different ideas about what a balanced budget is, but it's certainly one of the key statistics that people would use to judge your work in your building of a budget. Uh, and uh, it's a statistic you are in a better position to define than anybody who looks at it because of the complexity of the budget and the use of funds. So I, I hope you give some thought to saying, yes, it's balanced and this is what it means or no, it's not balanced. And that's why we have a revenue problem. Uh, so I think it would help the discussion if you could do that. People ask me when they know that I listen to these meetings to give them a summary. That's impossible. Uh, so maybe if you had a few key statistics about the budget, uh, it would be useful for the public discussion. Thanks very much for what you do. Thank you very much, Julian. Appreciate your time. Uh, Matt, is there anyone else out there? doesn't look like it. Okay, with that, we'll close public comments. And if there's nothing else for the good of the order, it's not wood, uh, we'll adjourn.